Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Bosco Theatre. This is uh, apparently the more experimental strand of the Edinburgh International Book Festival. And Darren informed me earlier that we're clashing with Eminem at Bell Houston Park tonight. <laughs> so <laughs> they kept this was sold out, so they got as a secondary ticket. Uh, but obviously, it's a, it's a big occasion uh, for Darren. It's a big occasion for you, and we're glad you're here to celebrate. Uh, Darren McGarvey is a well-known hip-hop artist, social commentator, regular presenter on like BBC. Uh, he's churned out over 15 albums, 17 maybe. Uh, huh? That's quite a <laughs> formidable back catalogue. But this is a first for him tonight as well, and I don't imagine there's many firsts left for Darren to do. It's the arrival of his first book, Poverty Safari. <laughs> <laughs> understanding the anger of Britain's underclass and it's no surprise it's been endorsed by I guess two of Scotland's biggest selling and best known offers in the world both Irvin Welsh and Joe Rowling you, uh, you can keep clapping as the night goes on I mean uh, and it, this is literally just docked down uh, into the book festival earlier on today. I don't think it's even out until November, so there's going to be a chance to get the book after this reading at the sign-in tent along there. I'll steal Dar Darren from you and just chase us down the road. Uh, but the way this is going to work, we're going to talk a little bit about the book. We're going to chat between ourselves. Uh, it's very open to you to ask questions throughout the night. We don't want you sitting on a burning question uh, that, that couldn't possibly wait till the end. Darren's going to do a bit of a reading from the book from you at that point, and you know there might be some other shit that happens, but we'll just see how that goes. Uh, so what I guess a, a good starting point for me with this was uh, I read some articles by you recently about writing a book and just the whole concept of writing a book, and in your own words, part of the banner behind that was you never thought that people like you would write a book. Ah, uh, that's that's correct. Um just before we start, I'm just like quite stunned by how many people are here <laughs> uh, and, and such diversity. Obviously everyone is equally beautiful, <laughs> but no, it's really nice to see so many people here. I can't believe I've worried so much about it. Yeah. <laughs> Lesson learned. Um, yeah, so the article sort of touched on one of the themes of the book is this idea, I mean at a surface level of people like me don't write books, it's this idea of imposter syndrome you know it's this idea that that uh you know writing is is reserved is exclusive preserve of a specialist class and in some ways i guess it might be but then at the same time it's like you know it's that wall that you build yourself of of creating an obstacle on your own path uh, and and really what i was trying to put across was the the level of 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 friction that you'll face when you try to do something that you want to achieve, not just writing a book, whatever it might be, uh, you've got to match that with belief, you know, you've got to match that with belief, you've got to visualise really clearly what it is you want to do, and it doesn't matter how many people tell you you can't do it or you shouldn't do it or disagree with the fact that you're doing it, you can listen to those things and you can let those things bother you, you can consider those things, certainly, but you've got to also listen to your gut, and if your gut's telling you doesn't matter if you can write a book you're gonna write a book mm. and that's and that's just uh, what I was trying to put across with that you know and you did it an easy point in your life just embarking on new fatherhood a quiet time for you I <laughs> exactly but well, I mean uh, that nothing kind of nothing f concentrates the mind like the top of your child's lungs at four in the morning <laughs> the baby's just like screaming daddy who's gonna take care of me <laughs> security <laughs> and uh, and I'm yeah. like, right, okay, so I've really got about a year to really throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Otherwise, it just becomes indulgent, you know? So, um, so I'm happy to report it's going well so far. <laughs> so, but there was two elements, wasn't it? You did a bit of crowdfunding for it, but now you have a p reputable Scottish publisher on board at the same time, so those two things have sort of came together. Yeah, I chose to go down the crowdfunding route because much like the fact that I don't, don't uh, sometimes d wasn't comfortable seeing myself as a writer or an author, for the reasons we just discussed. Also, uh, Creative Scotland, for whatever reason, just doesn't feel like something I should apply to, you know, and, I, and I, I'm happy to discuss that with Creative Scotland at some point. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but you know, for 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 me, then I, I I felt like I didn't want to have to justify what I was doing, and worst of all, I didn't want to have to explain something like this book available soon in all good bookstores. <laughs> I didn't want to have to explain that what it was to someone who hadn't experienced it. Mm. You know, so I just went to my audience and I'm and I'm like, look, I've written a lot of stuff over the years. You've been like checking it and reading it, and I don't think the people that read my work necessarily are looking to find something they agree with all the time. I think I'm cultivating a kind of culture of debate around the stuff that I do. Uh-huh. So I just threw it open. I thought I'll just put my balls on the chopping block here. <laughs> it's a big risk because if the crowdfund doesn't come off, it's quite embarrassing and humiliating. <laughs> but again, you've just got to have that belief, you know. And then actually, and then and then actually worked. And what that did was it. It allowed me to buy enough heroin <laughs> that uh, all of the anxiety around writing the book was dealt with. <laughs> um, and obviously, <laughs> I'm not going to rush your laughter at any point of the night. Those are golden moments there. <laughs> uh, so obviously a big part of the book is, is you telling personal stories about where you're from, how you've grew up. Uh, how you got through that, how you coped with that, uh, your own personal mechanisms. And then there's the next stage to that, which is this academic, philosophical, conceptual element of what you can take from the lessons those learned and how that w- relates to the wider community. And I think a really important part of that, which is like the spinal cord going through the book, so these two different dichotomies of thinking, is one, talking a bit about your own experiences growing up in this area, and then two, that developing into more conceptual stuff like the Pollock Free State, and how though you've sort of carried that with you, and the journey it has taken, this concept of area and community, and then the more wider conceptual understanding of that, and at what point that sort of dropped to you. Yeah, it, it obviously I knew I had to put my best foot forward in terms of, of framing it with my personal experience. And I know that I write, I, I, I know that that's where I learned how to become a writer, apart from obviously reading other people's writing and watching other people speak. But really what, what I wanted to do was sort of just use that almost as a kind of bait, you know, to say what I really want to say. Um, obviously everyone enjoys talking about themselves from time to time. <laughs> Uh, but I don't actually enjoy it as much as a lot of my writing would suggest. It's, it's something I've been conditioned to do. Uh, because when you come from my sort of background, uh, then keep people are often keen to give you a platform mm-hmm. uh, in order to testify your poverty experience and, and, and that in some way kind of authenticates what they're doing, whether it's their organisation, their charity, uh, their community group. And this is a kind of feature of working class life that's not articulated very clearly. Uh, because often working class people when they're fulfilling that role uh, they're just so happy someone's listening to them they don't actually realise that they could be being exploited in some way but also it's important to try and get across in the book that while there might be an exploitation taking place it's not conscious, it's not malign people are operating often with very good intentions but we speak across such a wide ravine of experience that often just try to talk to each other leads to us feeling deeply offended unheard and for me that's what I was trying to kind of arrive at and all, uh, while at the same time uh, addressing the ultimate question what in class people get is why are you so angry mm. you know so by talking about experiences like the Pollock Free State linking all of that as coherently as I can to my personal experience of growing up in an alcoholic home and how our family struggled it's not just about me and my family it's about all of us that grew up in deprived communities it's like there's a personal experience married to a stressful social environment, married to political exclusion, married to this cultural ravine across which it's difficult to speak to the people who have real agency, even though they're saying they're acting in your best interest. Follow me, folks, right? Just keep up if I'm losing you here. <laughs> and so ultimately, I feel the best way to try and actually cross that ravine is for us to lower our defences, to reconnect with having good faith in other people's intentions and that actually that, that, that increases the chances of someone you would normally disagree with uh, of, of doing the same thing and actually come to appreciate one another's dilemmas and difficulties and frustrations while at the same time obviously I feel uh, working class wor- working class culture is not seen as culture, it's seen as an absence of culture you know, so it's like, it's on this spectrum of you're in working class culture and then it needs to be kind of educated out of you so you can learn to speak in a kind of Radio 4 register, 
And if you choose not to do that, then fuck you, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so what I'm trying to show is actually there's a richness to the way that working class people are, even the violent communities. There's a moral code, there's ethics, there's a moral logic that people exist in. And that, and that it's not often as kind of, eh, I don't know, as, as sort of eh, derelict spiritually as, as often a lot of people think it is, mm-hmm. just because it's aggressive. <coughs> Aye. And there's a brilliant, I mean, obviously you're sort of demonstrating how quickly you develop words and sentences and structures. There's a sort of eureka moment in the book where you've been having a bit of a hard time and you start to learn that you've got this aptitude for language and it's part of your survival instinct and you take stories about your own personal structures and circumstances which other people might have exploited at school, bullies might have made jokes about and you relay those stories yourself. You take back your own content and you do it funnily, you do it dexterously and you starve them of the opportunity to use your own life against Mm. you and it feels like this real moment of empowerment within the book. I uh, definitely. I mean, that's that. That was something I felt that I had to address because everyone does it. It's just it's a kind of Russian roulette. What weapon do you choose to fight back? Some people choose violence. Other people choose aggression. Other people become manipulators, uh, uh, and other people actually, you know, have uh, in working class communities and very nourishing homes where there's two parents and all of that. Then. Then, then, then they don't even need to adopt any of those strategies. There's as much kind of contentment in those homes as there is in the sort of affluent communities. For me, really, it was about uh, recognizing that if somebody's got to tell my story, it's going to be me. So that's where I learned um, to take ownership of this stuff. You know, I, I, I was the one making jokes about my mum being an alcoholic. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I had the jokes ready for everyone else's mum as well if they wanted to take it there. <laughs> And so, like, this is, like, I developed a kind of, like, I, 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 I've just always felt embattled. Uh-huh. So I always operated from a place of, I'm embattled, so I would foresee where the attack would come from, and I'd go in prepared in every situation, and I still do. So, uh, you know, it's a kind of hypervigilance, it's not sustainable, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, it serves you well when it, you're in the heat of a conflict, because, like, actually, nothing focuses my mind like that kind of conflict. Uh-huh. Uh, but obviously, you need to temper that with also being quite be re- being reasonable, uh-huh. and it doesn't help to always think that you're in some kind of threat or that there's a threat in your midst all the time. But for me, it was it was definitely becoming aware of of the reactions I'd get from adults when I used certain words and phrases, and seeing, all right, okay, this is a talent that I've got, so I need to. This is this is a form of currency I've got. Let me use this like other people use money or opportunities. Uh-huh. And that's how really I got here. It's just using words in the right time in the right place. So not always, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounded like it happened super early on because there's references to you correcting your mum's grammar at, at an age when I guess a lot of kids are gra- grappling with the concept of grammar. Yes, I mean, my, my, my mother, she... Uh, she she had such low self-esteem that actually, in s- rather than find that endearing or cute, she was the kind of person that would have felt threatened by that, even though I was so young. So there's something about me that threatened her more so than anyone else. And this is something I see in a lot of people in, uh, you know, not, not so much necessarily just deprived communities, but when I work in prisons or schools, there's this kind of, there's this, uh, uh, people are what you would call sensitive. Uh, to other people judging them, even their own children. And, and, and that was a function of my mother's nature that she obviously tried to anaesthetise through alcohol in order to relieve those feelings. Um, but but um, the actually, I mean, the book obviously details a lot of the sort of instances I remember of interactions with my mother um, it, 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 because because what I'm trying to put across when I talk about that is it, it, it's not for sympathy. It's not, I'm not trying to exploit anyone in my family's experience. I get it harder than anyone in the book, hmm. harder than the Tories, harder than <laughs> any institution. By the end of the book, I have actually vomited up everything, turned myself inside out, try to find the truth. And uh, the reason I talk about my mother is because really what, what we see is the, the, the damage that, that abuse early on can do to a person how it can deform them, disfigure them, to the extent that they become that, the opposite of what they want to do. 
and, and, and that this is happening all the time, the cycle repeating itself in communities like the one that I grew up in. And it, but it's going to take us uh, from those communities to, to interject into the conversation that goes on in, about our lives without us, to fill in that vital gap in everyone else's understanding about the fact that uh, we, ex- we, we understand people need to take responsibility. We understand we can't blame our problems on everybody else. And, that, and there's a lot of that in the book that people won't like. But at the same time, the social conditions that people are forced to be raised in, I've got a lot to answer for. And if we're serious about dealing with the problem, then we have to first like, really just honestly talk about what it is. And poverty is the biggest driver of child abuse out there. And child abuse is the thing that's fueling all of the other social problems. And all you need to do is set foot in any school, residential school, orphanage, any public institution, any, anywhere in the care system, and that is what you see. And there is a point in the book as well where sort of in a, in a retort to the reader, you turn your family circumstances into a set of statistics, the type of statistics that people are questing for that come into these areas and fill out surveys at the same time, who's went to uni, who's got a criminal record, uh, who's been in trouble with the police, with like all these different things that happen and you put it down into a statistical analysis and it just shows how bland and one dimensional it is compared to the stories that you've just been telling. Uh, I, I, I definitely and, and, and uh, you know I didn't necessarily find that to be the most of one of the effective parts of the book but the minute that I could see some of the reactions of the people that got to see that but then I started to go all right okay I'm onto something here basically like Michael's talking about the, 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 the book sets up a few chapters that jumps between kind of personal stories and then talks a wee bit more it's a wee bit kind of more social commentary and it sort of oscillates between the two until you s- you're starting to get a sense of myself our family dynamic in this environment and then sort of halfway through the book it turns us all into statistics so me and my siblings it would say you know uh, two in five of us have had substance misuse problems. Uh, three in, uh, of, of us have got a criminal record. Uh, five of us don't go on holidays every year. Five of us don't have access to a bank of mum and dad. All of these different things. And it really just sort of it inverts what usually happens. Which is, I mean, you go to a conference and it's full of well-meaning people for the community. Um, uh, but they're talking about statistics. Do you know what I mean? Statistics. And it's like, okay, I understand the role that statistics play. I'm not dismissing people, statisticians. We need that information, but we also need the, we also need to, to apply a sort of level of emotional intelligence to the whole thing and understand how people actually move through their life. Uh, and, and in order to do it, that's not something that statistics can adequately represent. It doesn't matter how sophisticated they are. It doesn't matter. Y- you, really need, you really need more people feeling confident to express what life is like and, 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 and how challenging it can be. And there's a point that sort of relates back to you open the book with a Tom Leonard poem. And it's a poem about a liaison coordinator coming into one of these areas. Uh, and the guy's basically saying just what we fucking need. It's nothing to do with all the drugs and the alcohol and the violence. We need a liaison coordinator to sort all of this out. Uh, Here, hallelujah, the answer to our problem uh, is claim in the form of this liaison coordinator. And it's about the distance that that creates. Just somebody with a titular banner, banner which just completely befuddles what this person is doing in that point in time. And there is a sort of, as you were saying, a facetious and aggressive attitude to that. But then at different points in the book, there's a, a bit of a turn turtle on, on the well-meaning nature of that and how this could be utilised more effectively. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, there's a lot of setup in the book where I try to sort of express that feeling that people have, not just working class people. I mean, we all, we all exist in our own community and we feel that some other community benefits from something that we don't benefit from and they have privileges that we don't have and they don't understand us. We all come from a community that feels like that, whether it's women, whether it's your race, your religion, whatever it is. And, and, uh, but it's the same for working class uh, people. And, and, and what I try to represent in the book at certain points is that sort of anger that we have, the facetiousness, as you say, mm. where we're just like, excuse my language, but <laughs> middle class cunts, do you know what I mean? <laughs> what do they know? Do you know what I mean? Listen to that. What do you mean? Blah, blah, blah. Garden readers this, garden readers that. 
And, 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 and you know, there's a sort of camaraderie there and it bonds us as a tribe and all of that. And it serves that kind of function, which is cool. But at the same time, actually, like, as we're engaging in that, and I learned this from my own experience, what we actually do is we're closing the possibility down for the dialogue to take place. Because really what we need to do as people from working class backgrounds, deprived backgrounds, whatever, we need to start assuming that we are welcome in the conversation about our own lives. Not only that, but that we are smart enough to take part in the conversation. So we have to counterintuitively learn to over... Uh, to, 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 to ignore all those impulses in us, to retreat back to our own wee enclave, where the banter about middle class folk this, and banter about this and that. We need, we need to try and resist that. People will tell you that you're betraying your class by doing that. They're wrong, and I plan to tell them that they're wrong, because society's not gonna go anywhere unless we're all in the conversation together, trying to figure out how to listen to each other a bit better. And uh, I don't know if you've seen social media lately, hmm. but you know, this staying in one conversation and just talking to people you agree with, it's not helping, it's not helping anybody. And I felt like subtly addressing that in the book by talking about the class divide, but really it's just about divides generally and try to kind of find a way through. Another thing that you talked about that I hadn't seen mentioned a lot in a lot of other poverty discussions or economic deprivation discussions was you went into a bit of a discussion about your own uh, idea of eating bad food and like all you like considerations of your own weight problems when you would relapse into McDonald's and things like this and what all that steered back to it there was almost a comedy moment in the book where you went out guys in trick-or-treating dressed as a can of coca-cola begging for chocolates and sweeties <laughs> <laughs> but that just shows you the ubiquity of sugar that's a true story but what a, l a l <laughs> dressed as a can of Coca-Cola. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but what a lot of this came down to, and what a lot of other arguments steered into, especially what the statistics weren't capturing, was this notion of stress and how it can affect things of people in poverty situations, which isn't commonly discussed or understood to the degree it needs to be. Exactly, and that's the central theme of the book. Really, is how stress. Uh, stress is a primitive response, right? So stress is a physical manifestation of emotional strain. And it's something that human beings developed as a survival instinct in order to protect them from predators, right? So it was a time when other versions of us were running about being chased by woolly mammoths, maybe no woolly mammoths, <laughs> wildebeests, uh, <laughs> dangerous other tribes, right? <laughs> other tribes and so we develop the stress response that puts us in a state to physically prepare us for a confrontation so you're in a fight or flight response the best way that i could try and distill what a fight or flight response means to you is see when you're in a dentist chair <laughs> and they reach into your mouth of a drill and your body tenses up and every other thought that was in your head before about how you're going to be chilled and how you're listening to the radio empties out your head and you just go, I've got something in my mouth, he's going to actually hurt me. <laughs> and then you become mindful of the fact that that, and then you go, hang on, look at my body, it's all tense, I'm really tense. People who live in poverty are like that all the time. That is how they live. They're always prepared for conflict. They're in a constant state of fight or flight, which means that the normal repertoire of emotional responses aren't available to them. Because when you're in fight or flight mode, you're not thinking about negotiating your way around a problem. You're not thinking about how to marshal your emotional intelligence in pursuit of whatever it is that you want to acquire. You're thinking, I'm running like fucker, I'm going to knock this fucker out. <laughs> and you take that attitude into every single interaction that you're in with. And if everybody in your community is acting like that, then it's natural that people are going to look to coping mechanisms to manage the stress. Because ultimately, the stress becomes chronic, so it begins to disfigure you physically, which is why we see a prevalence of health problems in deprived communities that don't affect more affluent communities as much. And I think that stress ultimately is, is the key to unlocking how we could begin to uh, reverse some of these trends that we see. And the good thing about stress, if there is one, is that it's within your competence to address managing stress. So you don't need a revolution to deal with stress. You don't need uh, a Labour government to start learning to manage your stress. You don't need to put it off. You can tell yourself that you're going to keep drinking or smoking or eating shite. 
uh, because what's the point? Capitalism and all this. But you're just hurting yourself. You're just hurting yourself. It's your blood sugar. Do you know what I mean? It's your, it's your lungs. It's, it, it's your bladder. It's your liver. So ultimately, by just kind of like taking a passive attitude to your own men- for your own physical health, what you put in your body and how it affects you mentally, uh, actually, it, it, it's a big problem in modern class communities. And what I try to put forward in the book is the political class are useless at the minute. So whether it's fair or not, it doesn't matter. We need to learn to start managing our stress just now in communities, setting up communities to teach people how to do this. And that's what I'm trying to do with the book. We need to start taking control of how we live our life. Speaking of what you're trying to do in the book and what you've done in the book, are you up for doing a little reading from it now? Aye, Even okay. it's just a prop, you know? Okay, no, Sells that's... Sells more copies that way. That's fine. Um, I think I might... Uh, I might just read the preface, actually, and give a preface to the preface. A pre-preface. <laughs> uh, so, obviously, the, the, most of the book was kind of, of, of written and uh, two days before the deadline, uh, the, the Grenfell Tower fire happened. And then... Uh, so many of the issues I discussed in the book converged on that tragedy. So straight away I was like, what am I going to do? Do I need to change the book? How do I do this? But then at the same time, actually, the book was didn't need change. I just acknowledged it in the preface because like, like everybody else here, I was quite affected by it and I felt that it spoke directly to one of the big problems we have currently in working class, underclass communities which is political exclusion. And actually for me, uh, the, the, that is the context of the Grenfell fire. People for years saying, we're worried about fire safety in this building. Literally saying, it's gonna take a massive loss of life before people start investigating the fire regulations in this community and how the community is managed. And even then after being proven right, people still speaking over the people in Grenfell, still not listening. Still thinking they're the experts. And it's like, come on, man, game's a bogey. So I'm just going to read the preface. Uh, this book, which began as a side project to my work as a rapper and columnist, solely consumed every waking moment of my life until eventually I had to draw down or stop all my other commitments to get it finished. It's taken over a year and a half to complete. On the 14th of June 2017, two days before my final deadline, I awoke to news of a fire in a tower block in West London. Like everyone, I was shocked, horrified, devastated by the images. As the morning progressed, more news emerged from the now smouldering shell of Grenfell Tower. We heard stories of people trapped in the upper floors, forced to throw young children from the buildings before being consumed by the flames themselves. Then there were the tales of heroism and sacrifice of people who ran into the building to alert their sleeping neighbours with no regard for their own safety. I kept thinking about the phone, about the phones that must have been ringing in the pockets of the dead. Later that day, we learned of the farewell messages posted on social media from victims who knew they were about to die. My eyes filled with tears at their courage in such homeless, at such hopeless circumstances. Trapped within the envelope, of smoke and flame that had engulfed their homes as they slept. These brave souls faced their final moments with incredible dignity. I thought of my own son and imagined having to choose between throwing him out of a window on the slight chance he would survive and keeping him in my arms until the flames consumed us. Just contemplating such a choice is terrible enough. Residents in Grenfell were forced to make these decisions. This ferocious blaze which started in one flat before leaping up and around the entire building was not caused by someone looking to inflict harm. The fireball was not a consequence of a terrorist act. This inferno was a preventable disaster, a confluence of human error and industrial scale negligence. In the days that followed, the United Kingdom already destabilized following an election result that had severely weakened central government, stood on the very cliff edge of civil unrest Prime Minister Theresa May, accused of poor leadership in response to the fire, was bundled into a car after being jeered by locals in Grenfell. The news coverage showed a deeply traumatised community attempting to reorganise itself 
in a leadership vacuum on the ground. The authorities struggled to respond to the crisis. In the absence of any concrete information, angry, grief-stricken members of the community began filling the void with speculation and recrimination. When crowds gathered to make their presence felt at Kensington and Chelsea Borough Council headquarters, officials retreated behind the scenes to their very own forbidden city where they remained concealed out of public view like all of the mechanisms of power in this community. To, what, to the, the extent to which the voices of the Grenfell community had been routinely ignored played a key role in the sequence of decisions that led to the fire, not least the choice made in the name of cost saving, of flammable cladding and insulation materials that encouraged the fire's rapid, deadly spread through the building. I feel a strong sense of connection to the people of Grenfell. I know the hustle and bustle of high-rise life, the dark and dirty stairwells, the temperamental elevators that smell like urine and wet dog fur, the grumpy concierge, the apprehension you feel as you enter or leave the building, especially at night. I know that sense of being cut off from the world despite having such a wonderful view of it through a window in the sky, that feeling of isolation despite being surrounded by hundreds of other people above, below and either side of you. But most of all, I understand the sense that you are invisible, despite the fact that your community can be seen for miles around and is one of the most prominent features of the city skyline. Uh, as the days passed, a window opened up into Grenfell and by proxy into the lives of the underclass. Countless newspaper articles, bulletins and radio programmes attempted to capture what it was like to live in a tower block. Having been ignored and dismissed for so long, now suddenly everybody was interested in what life in a community like this entailed. But most people, despite their noble intentions, were just passing through on a short-lived expedition. A safari of sorts where the indigenous population is surveyed from a safe distance for a time before the window on the community closes and everyone gradually forgets about it. This is a pattern I've seen repeated in my own community for as long as I can remember, and so my intention has been for Poverty Safari to resonate with people who feel misunderstood and unheard, that the book might be a sort of forum giving voice to their feelings and concerns. The themes and issues explored here are clearly pertinent to those communities like Grenfell, where people are routinely ignored by decision makers who think they know better, even when they are fatally mistaken. What I explore here might lend context to the outpouring of rage that followed the Grenfell Tower fire and crucially an understanding that this rage is not about the fire or the tragic loss of life. In communities all over Britain where people, feel ex people experience multiple levels of deprivation in health, housing and education and are effectively politically excluded, anger is felt. And this anger is something we will have to get used to unless things change. In Poverty Safari, drawing from my own experience and expressing my own political perspective, I have attempted to set out what some of that change might look like. So, Speaking of decision makers and uh, people asking all the questions, I've got lots more to ask, but we're going to open this up into a bit of a forum now. We've put Darren on quite a few times at Noiriki. We've met his growing and engaged fan base, but you're a garlious and interesting bunch, so I'm sure you've came armed to the pockets for questions. So if you just put your hand up, we've got a roving mic. We have one at the back there. In writing this book, has your worldview changed or is your ideas that you went into the book being fully cemented by the process? Good question. Uh, no, th there, was a, there was a lot of uh, considering things as I went. You know, I, 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 since, I mean, definitely since I got sober and went through the process of recovering from alcoholism, then, then you can't help but be fundamentally changed. Uh, I need to understand what was fueling all of the the resentment that led to my drinking, and nowhere better to explore resentment than your own politics. 
And what I found was that, you know, despite the fact that I believe there's a lot of value in a lot of my beliefs as a person of the left and as a person from a working class community, I also realized that somewhere along the way, uh, I weaponized those beliefs uh, and, and went out and attacked people with them, truly believing I was entitled to do that. Now other people might feel different. Other people might feel entitled and I think you should go with your own instinct. But my instinct was that uh, I, 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 got, I developed a kind of distorted idea of what class politics is, what left-wing politics is in this age. No the 60s, no Tommy Sheridan, the day, Facebook, Twitter, get off your nut, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, and so really like what I started to learn was is I, is I started to examine my own anger more honestly, the composition of my anger. Then what I started to see also was I was, a, there was I was a lot of fault in my life. You know, I set the book up talking about the things that happened to me, but the book finishes with me talking about the harm I've done. You know, because it, it, it can become easy when you see yourself as a victim or when you see yourself as oppressed or you see yourself quite rightly as someone who has is, is, is not got a lot of power or agency in their life to really feel set upon and put upon by the world in every instance that you interact with it. Actually, there's a lot of grey areas, and I found in my own life that uh, it, it was neglecting to look for where I was at fault that was leading to this layer upon layer of delusion that takes so much energy to maintain, you know, and then realising right the pit of my stomach or this anger that I feel is uh, actually I, I'm just kind of rudderless, you know, I don't even know, I forgot what I'm angry about. <laughs> You know, I just hang around with people that say, ah, you're right to be angry about that. Or who clap when I say, I'm angry. But they're not clap. <laughs> but but they're, often, they're often clapping because I'm validating their anger as well. Uh, and, and, and really, like, I just wanted to t sort of, I, I figure if your idea of fundamental change doesn't include looking at yourself, it's not fundamental and it's not radical. And that's really what I'm trying to put across in the book. We've got another one over there. My sponsor's in here somewhere sitting like Obi-Wan Kenobi right now. Man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, so I'm really curious about the title of your book because um, mm. I come from Kenya and, and in some slums there, they actually have people who come in and usually it's foreigners who come and see how people live mm. in the slums, how they survive. And it's really quite horrible to... to, um, to to know that poor are actually doing this. And what's really interesting is that he's actually a hip hop artist in Kenya who's created his own kind of poverty safari where um, instead of taking foreigners to the places, you know, to show, oh, this is how poor people live, what he does is he shows this really um, empowered uh, groups doing interesting things and then he invites, um, you know, give whatever kind of donation you want and this goes to actual things they're creating or supports uh, certain uh, groups. So I'm really curious about the title, if it comes from that sort of understanding of flipping what people are doing, or if, if in fact, horribly so, here as well, that there are people who come and visit people living in, in impoverished um, areas. Thank you, good question. Uh, so the title, the, the, as you progress through the book, the title takes on different meanings, uh, especially at, at the kind of latter part of the book, but initially it is that sort of traditional safari that you describe, people coming to sort of spectate, on the reality of someone else's life, this idea of people being kind of objectified in a way, uh, which we all experience degrees of objectification relative to our, the configuration of our own identity. You know, so me as a working class white guy, I feel objectified in a different way from maybe like a woman like yourself. Uh, but basically, I was trying to kind of zero in on this, uh, not just to explain it to middle class people who might be doing it, and not realizing it. Uh, but also, um, in the book constantly, what I'm really trying to do is like articulate this in a way for people in the community that I come from that might not yet have developed the way of expressing what it is that's going on. For me, the, pe the artists and writers and, and people in my community that I'm drawn to are the people that kind of distill what it is I'm seeing but can't verbalize down so that I then have a, a weapon, or maybe not a weapon, you know what I mean, m m maybe just a tool uh, t to advance in some way or create some kind of understanding. Um, and, 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 and actually, as the book progresses, the, 
the safari takes on different meanings. You know, by the end, you wonder, am I not engaging in this a wee bit? Do you know what I mean? Am I not being a bit of a hypocrite? The book addresses that subtly. Um, but but really, uh, uh, anybody that reads the book, um, then, then, then you realise that we all do this. We all do this. We all sort of muscle into someone else's life or experience. We take what we need to suit our arguments or whatever it is that we're doing. And then we, then we go away and we forget about them. We're not bad people for doing it. Um, but if we're mindful of the fact that we're doing it, then we can be, you know, uh, then th th that's all really we need to be, is mindful of the fact that that's what we're doing. Uh, and and that's, that's really what I'm trying to put across. One of many things I'm trying to put across. Hope that was a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Right, um, um, there's previous examples of local initiatives that have taken place in men's health issues, such as a healthy men's project in Motherwell that uh, was giving some quite good results. And then you read about in Lazy Riddick's, one of Lazy's books, how it got stifled ultimately by the way the council tried to exercise control and stifle it. Um, are there any messages in your book about how you think? Uh, local democracy might develop in order to address some of these issues such as splitting councils into more neighbourhood with more local control or are there any other models that you would think would be better suited? Uh, well the book, thanks for the question, the book the book doesn't go into specifics um, because uh, well first of all I want the book to be interesting <laughs> <laughs> that stuff is boring as fuck <laughs> uh, However, <laughs> however, uh, I do touch on it kind of anecdotally and try to write about it in an entertaining way by, 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 by demonstrating the issues as how people might experience them. So I use an example in Pollock where we had uh, the Pollock Free State. So basically I tell the story of, ultimately it's the story of a community becoming activised and mobilised so deeply to the extent that, that people recovered from addictions and alcoholism by getting involved in this activity and uh, people negotiated the very difficult business of a community that's living off the grid in a forest uh, where you have middle class students and academics coming down because they're on a bit of a safari. Then you've got the Neds for the scheme who think this is a good place to get high. And what happens is they're all angry about something, they all want to change something, but then they meet at this ravine, you know? They meet at this ravine where their experience, uh, while being quite similar in a, to an extent, the way they talk about it to each other is, creates a certain tension. And I think that that tension is evident in all of the institutions that you describe, where ultimately because of social mobility, which for anybody who doesn't know, is just the extent to which you can ascend in society, based on where you come from uh, and your attributes, you know, whether you've got good health or not and stuff like that. And really, people who are more socially mobile will ascend into positions of authority in these institutions, which means often the people who run the institutions that are meant to deal with poverty don't have the insight into poverty, because if they had the insight, they'd have to have lived in poverty, and if they lived in poverty, they wouldn't get a job. <laughs> so, it's... Uh, so, so in Pollock, the Pollock Free State became a place where these people started to actually come across each other in real life. You know, there was no chaperone. No one's there imbued with legal authority. People had to really negotiate the difficult business of why are we here, what are we doing, what are the rules? And that, that went on and on for a very, very long time until they decided to put all the people there in jail and build a road through it. <laughs> so people from Newton Mearns could drive to the art school and not have to wait in offensive traffic queues. And what actually happened was, what actually happened was, uh, what actually happened was, they, 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 uh, they built a massive American style shopping mall, right on, conveniently, right on the exit of the motorway where they knocked down the schools. And, and we were all like, well, this is all right, it's a bit of a game changer actually, do you know what I mean? They're doing the Pollock Centre up. <laughs> so maybe actually Pollock will be known for something good then, but did you say they're gonna have like, real restaurants in this place? Then, of course, we found out it was going to be called Silverburn. Yeah. So they didn't just take us off our land. They didn't just ignore the fact that we didn't want the road because none of us drove cars. <laughs> but they also changed the name of the biggest success story of the area that we come from. 
And within a space of 10 years, people went for protesting against the local authority to petitioning to get a McDonald's. And this is what happens to the political polarity in an area, <laughs> when you essentially just kind of rip the political spine out of it. So I think like what, what we're seeing now is a resurgence of community activism after that kind of the peak neoliberal period where everyone got distracted a wee bit by the, s the new centre of the community, which was a shop. But ultimately, you don't own that community. Try going into that community and not buying something, and you'll see how long you're allowed to walk about in it. So what we need to return to is, is a centre in the community. Think of a centre, not as a building with shops in it, but as a verb. It's, it's meant to centre the community. So we need to build our own community centre where we come together to address these issues. Because ultimately, um, that's, that's the heartbeat right there. And, and, and you don't get change in the institutions until the people in the institutions are frightened of the people in the community. And the people in the community develop that sort of clout by coming together and realising their power. Um, and that's hope answers your question. <laughs> it's also worth saying quickly, I keep forgetting this is my event. I'm like, oh, somebody's got to kick me out. You know? <laughs> um, That'll be me after a couple I, uh, more questions. But it's just, you know... Like, I don't mean to sound kind of cocky when I'm, when I'm saying that stuff because, like, I believe that people in uh, the left and working class communities, we need to challenge ourselves and we need to challenge each other. Uh, the problem is a lot of the time the challenges aren't lateral like that, you know, across from each other. The challenge is top down. So people are less likely to listen to the challenge, do you know what I mean? They're le more likely to dismiss someone challenging them from above. Uh, uh, how we d negotiate that between ourselves in terms of challenging ourselves, who knows? I mean, we've got violent pockets in our community. How do we challenge that? Do we do it directly? Do we go to the polis? How do we deal with things? Um, but I'm certainly not calling for the community to come together and start bullying their way around or start seeing it as a sort of green light to, to, to uh, dismiss other people's experience just because they appear to come from an affluent community. Uh, you know, I think... For me, a theme of the book and a theme of my own life is emotional intelligence. Bringing emotional intelligence into everything you do. It might be justified for you to be angry at a politician, but see if you really want something done, do you think going in and shouting and calling the person a prick's the way to do it? Sometimes I, sometimes no. <laughs> emotional intelligence is knowing when to do it and when to do something else. And that's something I don't see a lot being discussed on the left if we're talking about fundamental change and radical change and all that. You know, just going into communities where people are already predisposed to stress and anger is actually killing them and telling them to get angrier might not be the most long-sighted thing to do. Especially when they all start dying at 69 and you need to go and start recruiting 15-year-olds that have not got a clue. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like... <laughs> Do we have any more questions? We have a, a few more, eh? Uh, up here on the left first. Does social media energise or frustrate you? Does it help your creative process? Mm. That was one of mine from later on. No, just I'm not taking credit uh, for it. No. <laughs> Still your question. So, so, so sh social media uh, has been really beneficial in my life. I mean, it's, it's given me a bit of autonomy, a bit of agency, being able to kind of like take control of aspects of my life, whether it's sort of learning more about the potential for an audience or connecting with other ideas that I wouldn't normally be exposed to. But like everything, uh, there are massive drawbacks. Uh, for me, as a person, personally, the, the drawback is sometimes, you know, if I don't have a strong sense of self-worth, then I can become whatever social media decides I am that day, or whatever I think social media decides I am that day. And uh, sometimes I'm not mindful enough of that, so, you know, if, if you all go home and say, oh, wait, Loki's book thing, it was brilliant. If I'm not feeling uh, centred, then I can start thinking, oh my God, I'm a genius. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Or if, 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 if all you go home and say something good, but why do you say, actually, you know, he's an egotistical prick, talks about himself all the time, <laughs> uh, then, then it doesn't matter that everyone else said it was good. If I'm not feeling centred, that's the thing that I'll focus on. And I'll actually become physiologically harmed by tuning into the negativity. So social media amplifies all of that. So the problem's not social media, the problem is me. Um, but obviously, it's very easy for me to blame other people. 
you know, ultimately what I think social media means for uh, the fu future of the species is that our brains aren't evolved enough to comprehend that level of simultaneous complexity. So, like, your brain, as a, as a friend of mine pointed out the other day, is, a, is, is, a, is, is, is mainly designed to maintain in relationships. So that's the stuff we're good at. We're good at talking to each other. We're good at intelligence gathering. We're good at moving around, keeping things going in the proximity of our own life. But when you start to scale that up, it becomes more complicated. And when you've got social media basically showing it all happening at once, you actually just hit a wall. It's like trying to hear a dog frequency or a dog trying to hear a bat frequency. It's just no inner capability to do it. It's no inner remit. The problem we've got is we've not realised that yet. So we keep trying to impose meaning on all of this madness. It makes no sense. And uh, the more we do that, the more vulnerable we become to manipulation for politicians or writers like me. Uh, <laughs> Peddling their, uh, peddling their own version of how to deal with it. But I think it, it can be a good tool, but like a hot stove, you put your horn on it, you burn your horn, you don't do it again. Uh, I think we're all starting to learn our limitations when it comes to social media, and hopefully that will start translating culturally soon. We've probably got time for one more question. <laughs> do we have one up here at the back somewhere? We do. Final question, so let's make it a winner. No pressure. You started out by saying how proud you were about having written a book and your shock and surprise that you were capable of doing it. Uh, what would you do about the number of boys, particularly working class boys, who don't, are not inspired to read, they're not interested in reading, um, and they're really not switched on by it at all, and they're being disenfranchised because they're not learning how to do it? Well, one of the things I thought would maybe help is write a book that they feel some sort of connection to and that might inspire them over the initial hurdle. I mean, for me, I connected very, very uh, directly with hip-hop uh, as a culture, not just because of the subject matter, but because of the way it was being expressed. Uh, and, and then that, that I developed a kind of confidence and an understanding of the other things that I liked. Uh, but there was other hip-hop out there I didn't connect with first because they used big words or because they dress in a different way. I thought, that's pretentious, that's not for me, or that's too poppy or whatever. Uh, and I, I think ultimately, like then the the, the 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 way that people connect, not just with books, but with anyone, is that they see themselves reflected in it somehow. So it becomes within their interests to pursue it a wee bit further. And I think, like what what I notice is, uh, in my life, I didn't really connect with any Scottish artists or Scottish writers. In school, I was taught about people who wrote in a weird kind of language. Apparently it was Scots, but I was talking Scots, but <laughs> my Scots wasn't fancy like their Scots, and I didn't quite, how was I and Ed, but they were like bards and all that. <laughs> I was like, is Scots no like a living thing? Like, <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and so like, you know, I, I felt rejected by the culture in my own country. And then of course I started performing in the West End of Glasgow. I felt really fucking rejected. <laughs> Uh, so I, I go in, I go, I, I go into the, uh, every interaction hoping maybe to see someone who's looking for that identification. You know, whatever it is, it might be class, it might be reading, it might be recovery, it might be politics, whatever. But you know, I, de I definitely see the value in not trying to kind of like guide people around and all that, but I realise that's what people are looking out to culture for. Culture, reading, music, it all becomes a kind of patchwork map for living. So if it's no useful to you, What's the point? The key is, how do we get it to people who don't usually engage with it or don't think it's for them? And that's why the book starts with me talking about that, because people who don't read will find themselves reading because that's what I'm talking about. I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. Now, the book's not even out till November, but we'll be just down the road in the signing tent. You can get Darren to sign it for you. You can get hold of it months before other people. It's powerful, it's provocative, and it's entirely necessary at this point in time. But I'm sure you'll agree he deserves one more big round of applause. Put your hands together for Darren McGarvey. I'm not going to do it.